Yeah, DB. Oh, just cleaning out the deadwood. Okay. Look, Mr. Cannell, I just can't afford to be without work right now, not even for a day. I've got a mother and two kids, sister. More good luck telegram. Well, you know how it is. I, I've just got to keep on working, see? Sorry, sister. I was sent down here to clean house. I told you I can't use your column anymore. It's lavender and no lace. Send those other people in. I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I get $30 a week. I'll take 25, 20 if necessary. I'll do anything you say. It isn't the money. We're after circulation. What we need is fireworks. People have been hit with sledgehammers. Start arguments. Oh, I can do that. I know this town inside out. Oh, give me a chance, All please. right, come in, come in, come in. Okay, she's got your check. Who are these people? Gibbs, Farley, Cunningham, Giles. Hey, your sister, don't forget to get out your last column before you pick up your check. Shine or collar, man. Big rich slob like D.B. Norton buys a paper and 40 heads are chopped off. Did you get it too? Yeah. You too? Oh, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. Why don't we tear the building down? Before you do, Ann, perhaps you'd better finish this collar. Yeah, lavender and old lace. Wait, Joe. Wait. Want fireworks, huh? Okay. Here. Below is a letter which reached my desk this morning. It's a commentary on what we laughingly call a civilized world. Dear Miss Mitchell, four years ago, I was fired out of my job. Since then, I haven't been able to get another one. At first, I was sore at the state administration because it's on account of the slimy politics here. We have all this unemployment. But in looking around, it seems the whole world's going to pot. So in protest, I'm going to commit suicide by jumping off the city hall roof. Signed, a disgusted American citizen, John Doe. Editor's note, if you ask this column, the wrong people are jumping off the roofs. Hey, and this is the old fake a isn't it? Never mind that, Joe. Go ahead. And it's because of the slimy politics that we have all this unemployment here. There it is. That's D.B. Norton's opening attack on the governor. Why, Jim, it's just a letter sent into a column. No, no, I can smell it. That's Norton. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Governor. Rather early. Governor, did you happen to see this in the new bulletin? Mm, yes. I had it served to my breakfast this morning. Jim thinks it's D.B. Norton at work. Of course it is. Oh, come. Jim, that little item, D.B. Norton does things in a much bigger way. This is his opening attack on you, Governor. Take my word for it. What did he buy a paper for? Why did he engage a high-pressure editor like Connell for? He's in the oil business. I tell you, Governor, he's after your scalp. All right, Jim, all right. Don't burst a blood vessel. I'll look into it. Uh-huh. you get me Spencer of the Daily Chronicle, please? Yes, yes, I saw it, Governor. If you ask me, that's a phony letter. Why, that gag has got whiskers on it. Hmm? Okay, I'll get the mayor and maybe the Chamber of Commerce to go after them. Get Mayor Lovett on the phone. Uh, sorry, the mayor is busy on the other phone. Yes, I know, Mrs. Brewster. It's a terrible reflection on our city. I've had a dozen calls already. Uh, Spencer of the Chronicle. Hold him. Uh, just a minute. Yes, Mrs. Brewster. I'm listening. I insist that this John Doe man be found and given the job at once. Now, if something isn't done about it, I'll call out the whole exiguity. Yes, Spencer? Oh, the governor? Well, what about me? It's my building he's jumping off of, and I'm up for re-election, too. What are you doing? Get Canal with the bullet. Why? Why, he's liable to go right past my window. Get me Canal. What was that? Oh, what? Out the window. Something just flew by. I didn't see anything. Well, don't stand there, you idiot. Go and look. Open the window. Oh, why did he have to pick on my building? Is there a crowd in the street? No, sir. Then maybe he's caught on a ledge. Look again. 
I think it must have been a seagull. A seagull? What's a seagull doing around the city hall? That, that's a bad omen, isn't it? Oh, no, sir. The seagull is a lovely bird. It's all right, Mrs. Brewster. It was just a seagull. Can I help? Nothing's happened yet. No, I'm watching. Don't worry, Mrs. Brewster. J just leave it all to me. Spencer, I'll call you back. Hello. Can I help? This is... What are you doing? This is the mayor. Yes, mayor, love it. How many times are you going to call me? I've got everybody and his brother and sister out looking for him. Did you see the box I'm running? An appeal to John Doe. Think it over, John. Life can be beautiful, says Mayor. If you need a job, apply to the editor of this paper, and so forth and so forth. Okay, Mayor, I'll let you know as soon as I have something. What? Well, pull down the blinds. Turn up the Miss Mitchell's house, Ross. Boy, she's in a bad way. Where is she? Hey, do you know something? She supports a mother and two kids. What do you know about that? Did you find her? No. Her mother's awful worried about her when she left the house. She said she was going on a roaring drunk. Of the girl, I mean. Go out and find her. Sure. Hey, but the biggest thing I didn't tell you, her old man uh, is Doc Mitchell. You know, the doctor yeah. saved my mother's life and wouldn't take any money for it. You remember that. Okay, boss, I'll go and look for her. Holy smokes, Commissioner, you've had 24 hours. Okay, Hawkshaw, grab a pencil. Here it is again. About five foot five, brown eyes, light chestnut hair, and as fine a pair of legs as ever walked into this office. Do you want to see me? No. I've had the whole Army and Navy out searching for you because that's a game we play here every day. I remember distinctly being fired. That's right. But you have a piece of property that still belongs to this newspaper, and I'd like to have it. What's that? The letter. What letter? The letter from John Doe. Oh. The whole town's in an uproar. We've got to find him, and the letter's the only clue. There is no letter. We'll get a handwriting expert to... What? There is no letter. Say that again. There's no letter. I made it up. You made it up? Mm-hmm. You said you wanted fireworks. Don't you know there are nine jobs waiting for this guy? Twenty-two families want to board him free? Five women want to marry him? And the mayor's practically ready to adopt him? And you... Just call the morgue, boss. He said there's a girl there. Shut up. Ann! Say, why didn't you... Baby, only one thing to do, Hank. Wrap the whole business quickly. How? Run a story. Say John Doe was in here and you're sorry he wrote the letter and... That's right. They've got it, sure. He came in here and I made him change his mind. Well, an editor saves John Doe's life. Well, it's perfect. I'll have Ned write it up. Oh, Ned, I got a story I want you to... Wait a minute. Listen, you great big wonderful genius of a newspaper man. You came down here to shoot some life into this dying paper, didn't you? Well, the whole town's curious about John Doe, and boom, just like that, you're going to bury him. There's enough circulation in that man to start a shortage in the ink market. In what man? John Doe. What John Doe? I, John Doe, the one I made up. Look, genius, now look. Suppose there was a John Doe and he walked into this office. What would you do? Find him a job and forget about the whole business, I suppose, huh? Not me. I'd make a deal with him. A deal? Sure, when you get hold of a stump that sells papers, you don't drop it like a hot potato. Well, this is good for at least a couple of months. You know what I'd do? Between now and, let's say, Christmas when he's gonna jump, I'd run a daily yarn. Starting with his boyhood, his schooling, his first job. A wide-eyed youngster facing a chaotic world. The problem of the average man of all the John Doe's in the world. Now. Then comes the drama. He meets discouragement. He finds the world his feet of clay. His ideals crumble. So what does he do? He decides to commit suicide and protest against the state of civilization. He thinks of the river, but no. No, he has a better idea. The city hall. Why? Because he wants to attract attention. He wants to get a few things off his chest, and that's the only way he can get himself heard. So? So? So he writes me a letter, and I dig him up. He pours out his soul to me. And from now on, we quote, I protest by John Doe. He protests against all the evils in the world, the greed, the lust, the hate, the fear, all of man's inhumanity to man. Arguments will start. Should he commit suicide or should he not? People will write in pleading with him, but no. No, sir, John Doe will remain adamant. On Christmas Eve, hot or cold, he goes. See? Very pretty. Very pretty indeed, Miss Mitchell. But would you mind telling me who goes on Christmas Eve? John Doe. What John Doe? The one we hire for the job, you lunkhead. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get this through this lame brain of mine. Are you suggesting we go out and hire someone to say he's going to commit suicide on Christmas Eve? Is that it? Well, you're catching on. Who, for instance? Anybody. Uh, uh, Beanie will do. Why, sure. Who, me? Uh, jump off a... Oh, no. Any time at Christmas. I'm superstitious. <laughs> Miss Bishop, do me a favor. Will you go on out and get married and have a lot of babies? But 
stay out of newspaper business. Better get that story in, Hank. It's getting late. You're supposed to be a smart guy. If it was raining hundred-dollar bills, you'd be out looking for a dime you lost someplace. Holy smokes, wasting my time listening to this mad woman. Look, Chief, look at the Chronicle. It's running on John Doe. They say it's a fake. Why, the no good the John Doe story amateur journalism. It's probably phony as a wonder anyone is taking it serious. What do you think of those guys? That's fine. That's fine. Now fall right into their laps. Go ahead. Say John Doe walked in and called the whole thing off. You know what that's going to sound like on top of this. That's all, Ned. Thank you. All right. Amateur journalism, huh? Why, that bunch of sophomores, I can teach them more about... Hey, boss, get a load of this. Wow. Look. What do they want? They all say they wrote the John Doe letter. Yeah, yeah that's all right, boss. Oh, they all wrote the letter. Tell them all to wait. Look, Mr. Connell, one of those men is your John Doe. They're desperate and will do anything for a cup of coffee. Pick one out and you can make the Chronicle eat their words. I'm beginning to like this. If you ask me, Hank, you're playing around with dynamite. No, 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 no. The gal's right. We can't let the Chronicle get the laugh on us. We've got to produce a John Doe now. Amateur journalism, huh? I'll show those guys. Sure, and there's no reason for them to find out the truth either, because naturally, I won't say anything. Okay, sister, you get your job back. Plus a bonus. What bonus? Oh, the bonus of $1,000. The Chronicle was going to pay me for this little document. You'll find it says, sir, I and Mitchell hereby certify that the John Doe letter was created by me. I can read, I can read. Sorry. You think this is worth $1,000, do you? Oh, the Chronicle would consider it dirt cheap. Packs everything, including a gun. Okay, sister, you got yourself a deal. Now let's take a look at the candidates. The one we pick has got to be the typical average man. Typical American that can keep his mouth shut. Show me an American who can keep his mouth shut and I'll eat him. Okay, Beanie, bring him in one at a time. Did you write that letter to Miss Mitchell? No, I didn't. What are you doing up here, then? Well, the paper says there were some jobs around loose. Thought there might be one left over. Had any schooling? Yeah, a little. What do you do when you work? I used to pitch. Baseball? Yeah, so my wing went bad. Where'd you play? Bush leagues, mostly. How about family? Got any family? No. Oh, just traveling through, huh? Yeah. Me and a friend of mine. He's outside. Looks all right. Be perfect, a baseball player. What could be more American? I wish he had a family, though. Be less complicated without a family. Look at that face. It's wonderful. They'll believe him. Come on. What's your name? Willoughby. John Willoughby. Long John Willoughby, they called me in baseball. Uh, would you, uh, would you like to make some money? Yeah, maybe. Would you be willing to say you wrote that letter and stick by it? Mm. I get the idea. Yeah, maybe. That's our man. He's made to order. No, I don't know. He don't seem like the kind of a guy that would fall in line. When you're desperate for money, you do a lot of things, Mr. Connell. He's our man, I tell you. He fainted! On, get the up. water, quickly! Hurry up, Pop. Oh. All right, you sit down. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. How many is that, six? Pretty hungry, weren't you? Hey, all 
this John Doe business is batty, if you ask me. Well, nobody asked you. Trying to improve the world by jumping off buildings. You couldn't improve the world if the buildings jumped on you. Don't mind the Colonel. He hates people. He likes you well enough to stick around. Well, that's because we both play doohickeys. I met him in a boxcar a couple of years ago. I was fooling around with my harmonica, and he comes over and joins in. I haven't been able to shake him since. pictures of him like that, eating a sandwich and with a beard. But he's going to jump off a building. Yes, but not because he's out of a job. That's not news. This man's going to jump as a matter of principle. Oh, well, maybe you're right. We'll clean him up and put him in a hotel room under bodyguards. We'll make a mystery out of him. Did you speak to Mr. Norton? Thinks it's terrific. Says for us to go the limit. Wants us to build a bonfire under every big shot in the state. Oh, swell. Is that the contract? Yes. Yeah. What's he doing here? Friend of his. They play duets together. Duets? But can we trust oh. him? Oh, I trust him. Oh, you trusted me. Well, that's fine. I suppose he trusts you, too. Oh, stop Thanks. worrying. He's all right. Oh, okay, but we don't want more than a couple of hundred people in on this thing. Now, the first thing I want is an exact copy of the John Doe letter in your own handwriting. I've got it already. Here. Now, that's fine. Now, I want you to sign this agreement. It gives us an exclusive story under your name, day by day, from now until Christmas. On December 26th, you get one railroad ticket out of town. And the bulletin agrees to pay to have your arm fixed. That's what you want, isn't it? Yeah, but it's got to be by Bone Setter Brown. Okay, Bone Setter Brown goes. Here, sign it. Meanwhile, here's fifty dollars spending money. That's fine. B. Yes, boss. Take charge of him. Get him a suite at the Imperial and hire some bodyguards. He had some new clothes, Beanie. You think we better have him to allow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of them? Yes, both of them. But don't let them out of your sight. Hey, Beanie. Gray suit, huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fellas. Take it easy, John Doe. And you start pounding that typewriter. Oh, boy, this is terrific. No responsibilities in our part, just statements from John Doe, and we can blast our heads off. Before you pop too many buttons, don't forget to make out that check for a thousand. Um... Okay, fellas, now let me see. You sit outside the door, nobody comes in, see? You two fellas sit in here. Hey, pretty nifty, huh? You ain't gonna get me to stay here. Sure you are. No, sir. That spot under the bridge where we slept last night is good enough for me. Hey, what'll I do with this bag? Well, stick him in the bedroom. Give me mine. I ain't staying. You know, we were headed for the Columbia River country before all this John Doe business came up. You remember that, don't you? Sure, I remember. Say, is your ears popped coming up in the elevator? Mine did. Oh, long, John. I tell you, it's no good. You're gonna get used to a lot of stuff that's gonna wreck you. Why, that 50 bucks in your pocket's beginning to show up on you already. And don't pull that on me, neither. Stop worrying, Colonel. I'm gonna get my arm fixed out of this. Hey, here's some cigars the boss sent us. Have one. Hey, cigar. No. Say, I'll bet you even the major leaguers don't rate an outfit like this. Here, make yourself comfortable. Paper? Yeah, I don't read no papers, and I don't listen to radios either. I know the world's been shaved by a drunken barber, and I don't have to read it. I've seen guys like you go under before. Guys that never had a worry. Then they got a hold of some dough and went goofy. The first thing that happens hey, to a guy... Hey, you the bedroom. No. The first thing that happens to a guy like that, he starts wanting to go into restaurants and sit down at a table and eat salads and cupcakes and tea. Boy, what that kind of food does to your system. The next thing the dope wants is a room. Yes, sir, a room with steam heat and curtains and rugs. And before you know it, he's all softened up and he can't sleep unless he has a bed. Hey, stop worrying, Colonel. Fifty bucks ain't gonna ruin me. I've seen plenty of fellas start out with fifty bucks and wind up with a bank account. Hey, what's the matter with a bank account, anyway? And let me tell you, Long John, when you become a guy with a bank account, they got you. Yes, sir, they got you. Who's got him? The Helot. Who? Hey! There's the city hall tower I was supposed to jump off of. It's even higher than this. Who's got them? The Helots. Woo! Hey, wait a minute. 
You're not supposed to jump till Christmas Eve. Do you want to get me in a jam? If it's going to get you in a jam, I'll do you a favor. I won't jump. And when they got you, you got no more chance than a road rabbit. Hey, who'd you say was going to get him? Hey, is this one of those places where you ring if you want something? Yeah, uh, just use the phone. Boy, I've always wanted to do this. Hey, Doc, look. Look, Doc. Give me that again, will you? Who's going to get him? The Helots. Who are they? Listen, Sucky, you ever been broke? Sure, mostly often. All right. You're walking along. Not a nickel in your jeans. You're free as the wind. Nobody bothers you. Hundreds of people pass you by in every line of business. Shoes, hats, automobiles, radios, furniture, everything. And they're all nice, lovable people. And they let you alone. Well, is that right? Then you get a hold of some dough and what happens? All those nice, sweet, lovable people become helots. A lot of heels. They begin creeping up on you, trying to sell you something. They get long claws, and they get a stranglehold on you. And you squirm, and you duck, and you holler, and you try to push them away, but you haven't got a chance. They got you. First thing you know, you own things. The car, for instance. Now your whole life is messed up with a lot more stuff. You get license fees, and number plates, and gas, and oil, and taxes, and insurance, and identification cards, and letters, and bills, and flat tires, and dents, and traffic tickets, and motorcycle cops, and courtrooms, and lawyers, and fines, and a million and one other things. And what happens? You're not the free and happy guy you used to be. You got to have money to pay for all those things. So you go after what the other fellas got. And they are. You're a helot yourself. You win, Colonel. Here, take the 50. Go ahead and get rid of it. You bet I will, just as fast as I can. I'm going to get some canned goods, a fishing rod, and the rest I'm going to give away. Give away? Hey, uh, get me a pitcher's glove. I got to get some practice. Say. He's giving it away. I'm going to get me some of that. Hey, come back here, you heel lot. Will you send up five hamburgers with all the trimmings, five chocolate ice cream sodas, and five pieces of apple pie? No, apple with cheese. Yeah, thanks. Town. All set, Miss Ann. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> let's go. Um, let's see, we want some action in these pictures. Action? Mm-hmm. That's good. No, no, no. This man's going to jump off a roof. Oh. Here, wait a minute. Let me comb your hair. Sit down. Yeah, that's better. You know, he's got a nice face, hasn't he? Yeah, he's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, quiet egghead. All right, now a serious expression. Can't, I'm feeling too good. Oh, come on now, this is serious. You're a man disgusted with all of civilization. With all of it? Yes, you're sore at the world. Come on now. Oh, crabby guy, huh? Yeah. No, no. No, no. No, look, you don't have to smell the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, all those guys in the Never mind stand. those guys. All right, stand up. Now, let's see what you look like when you protest. Against what? Against anything, just protest. You got me. <laughs> oh, look, I'm the umpire, and you just cut the heart of the plate with your fast one, and I called it a ball. What would you do? Oh, you're dead, huh? Yeah. Why can't you call it right, you boneheaded? Grab it, Eddie, grab it!
I don't care whose picture they're publishing. I still say that this John Doe person is a myth, and you can quote me on that. And I'm going to insist on his being produced for questioning. You know as well as I do that this whole thing is being engineered by a vicious man with a vicious purpose, Mr. D.B. Norton. and Miss Mitchell are at the house, sir. Oh, they are? All right. Come on. Personally, I think it's just plain stupidity to drop it. Now, you should see a fan mail. Thousands. Why, it's going over like a house of fire. What are you afraid of, Canal? It's doubled our circulation. Yeah, but it's got everybody sore. Ads are being pulled. The governor's starting a libel suit. What's more, they all know John Doe's a phony, and they insist on seeing well, What about it? Let them see him. We'll go on one better. They can also hear him. You own a radio station, Mr. Norton. Why not put him on the air? Watch out for this damn DB. She'll drive you batty. Oh, Look, what? we can't let him get to this Bush League picture and start popping him. Good night. Now, tell him what that screwball might do. I walk in yesterday, here he is, standing on a table with a fishing pole, fly casting. Take my advice and get him out of town before this thing explodes in our faces. If you do, Mr. Norton, you're just as much of a dumb cluck as he is. Excuse me. No, you got yourself a meal ticket and you hate to sure let go. Sure, it's a meal ticket for me, I admit it, but it's also a windfall for somebody like Mr. Norton who's trying to crash national politics. That's what you bought the newspaper for, isn't it? You want to reach a lot of people, don't you? Well, put John Doe in the air and you can reach 130 million of them. He can say anything he wants and they'll listen to him. All right, we'll forget the governor and the mayor and all the small fry like that. This can arouse national interest. If he made a hit around here, he can do it every place else in the country. And you'll be pulling the strings, Mr. Norton. Go down to the office and arrange for some radio time. What they be? You're not going to fall. I want it as soon as possible. Okay. I just came in to get warm myself. Come on, let's go. Uh, don't you go. I want to talk to you. Sit down. This John Doe idea was yours, huh? Yes, sir. How much money do you get? Thirty dollars. Thirty dollars? Well, um, what are you after? I mean, what do you want? A journalistic career? Money. Money? Well, I'm glad to hear somebody admit it. Do you suppose you could write a radio speech that would put that fellow over? Oh, I'm sure I can. Do it and I'll give you a hundred dollars a week. A hundred dollars? That's only the beginning. You play your cards right and you'll never have to worry about money again. Oh, I know it. Hello. Hello. Whenever there's a pretty woman around. Uh, <laughs> this is my nephew, Ted Sheldon, Miss Mitchell. How do you do? How do you do? All right, Casanova, I'll give you a break. See that Miss Mitchell gets a car to take her home. Always reading my mind, aren't you? Thank you very much for everything. And, Miss Mitchell, I think from now on you'd better work directly with me. Yes, sir. Yeah, but Mrs. Burke had her baby yesterday. Nine pounds. Mm. And there wasn't a thing in the house. 
And then the community chess lady came. And, and the 50's all gone, huh? Who's the 10 for? The Webster. The Webster. You remember those lovely people your father used to take care of. I thought I'd buy them some groceries. Oh, Anne, <laughs> dear, it's a shame those... You're poor... marvelous, boy. You're just like father used to be. Do you realize a couple of weeks ago we didn't have enough to eat ourselves? Well, yes, I know, dear, but these people are in such need. And we have plenty now. If you're thinking of that thousand dollars, forget it. It's practically all gone. We owed everybody in town. Now, you've just got to stop giving all your money away. Oh, Anne, dear. Oh, I'm sorry, Ma. Oh, don't pay any attention to me. I guess I'm just upset about all this. Gee whiz, here I am with a great opportunity to get somewhere. To give us security for once in our lives, and I'm stuck. If I could put this over, you or Mrs. Burke can have six babies. You mean the speech you're writing? Yeah, I don't know. I, I simply can't get it to gel. I created somebody who's going to give up his life for a principal. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to him over the radio. And unless he says something that's, well, that's sensational, it's just no good. Well, honey, of course, I don't know what kind of a speech you're trying to write. But judging from the samples I've read, I don't think anybody will listen. What? Darling, there's so many complaining political speeches. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. If you're going to have him say anything, why don't you let him say something simple and real, something with hope in it? If your father were alive, he'd know what to say. Yeah. Father certainly would. Wait a minute. Hmm? Your father's diary, Anne. Father's... I never knew he had a diary. There's enough in it for a hundred speeches. Things people ought to hear nowadays. You be careful of it, won't you, dear? Always help to keep your father alive for me. You bet I will, Ma. Wait a minute. John Doe don't want to sign no autograph. Well, what does he do all day? What does he do all day? He's writing out his memories. Oh. Sorry, lady, you can't see Mr. Doe. He wants to be alone. No. No, he just sits around all day and commutes with himself. Oh! I don't know how you're going to stand it around here till after Christmas. I bet you ain't heard a train whistle in two weeks. Steam right! I know why you're hanging around. Stuck on the girl. That's all a guy needs is to get hooked up with a woman. What was that, a single? First baseman dropped the ball. Butterfingers! Tough luck, pal. Guy has a woman on his hands. First thing he knows, his life is balled up with a lot more things. Furniture. Did you get him? You're out! Swell. What's this, the end of the eighth? Ninth. Hey, Beanie, there's a couple of mugs in the Chronicle snooping around out here. Ah! Come on, Angel Face. Gangway. What's Come the score, on. Angel Face? Three to two, off paper. Gee, that's great. You got swell form there. Must have been a pretty good pitcher. 
Pretty good. Hey, I was just about ready for the major leagues when I chipped a bone in my elbow. I got it pitching a 19-inning game. 19? Yeah. There was a major league scout there watching me, too. And he came down after a game of the contract. You know what? I couldn't lift my arm to sign it. I'll be okay, though, as soon as I get it fixed up. Too bad. What do you mean, too bad? Huh? Oh, that you'll never be able to play again. What are you talking about? I just told you I was going to get... Well, my... you know how they are in baseball if a guy's mixed up in a racket. Racket? What do you mean? Well, I was just thinking about this John Doe business. Why, as soon as it comes out it's all a fake, you'll be washed up in baseball, won't you? Yeah. I never thought about that. Gosh. And another thing, what about all the kids in the country? The kids that idolize ball players. What are they going to think about you? Yeah. Hey, Colonel. Did you hear that? I got to figure some way out of this thing. The elevators are still running. I know one way you can do it. How? Well, when you get up there on the radio, all you have to do is to say the whole thing's a frame-up. Make you a hero as sure as you're born. Yeah, but how am I going to get my arm fixed? Well, that's a cinch. I know somebody will give you $5,000 just to get up on the radio and tell the truth. $5,000? Yeah, $5,000, and he gets it right away. You don't have to wait till Christmas. Look out, Long John. They're closing in on you. Say, who's putting up this dough? The fellow runs the Chronicle. Here's the speech you make, and it's all written out for you. Five thousand dollars. Holy mackerel, I can see the helots coming, the whole army of them. It's on the level. Tickets for the broadcast are all gone. Phone the bulletin. Sorry, no more tickets left. Oh, John, all set for the big night? Well, turn around. One moment. Not fair. Oh, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Big smile. Okay, Jeannie, that will take him out. Now, look, John, here's the speech. It's in caps of double space. You won't have any trouble reading it. Not nervous, are you? No. Of course not. He wouldn't be. Who? John Doe, the one in there. Hey, don't let your knees rattle. It picks up on the mic. Oh, Jeannie, you needn't be nervous, John. All you have to remember is to be sincere. Pick up that phone, Miss Mitchell. It's for you. Okay. Hello? Yes, Mother. Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, there he is, the poor dear man. Oh, good oh, luck to you, yeah. Mr. Doe. Uh, we want you to know that we'll huh? all yes, for you. Sorry. The girl don't decide right that you're not to jump off any room. Oh, we'll stop it. Did you get the speech I gave you? Yeah. Come on, Mr. Doe. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 Oh, Mother says good luck, too. John, when you read that speech, please, please believe every word of it. He turned out to be a wonderful person, John. Who? John Doe, the one in the speech. Oh. You know something? I, I've i actually fallen in love with him. All right, there he is, sister. Now, come on, plenty of hope. What's the idea? No, 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 oh, that's too much. That's not, well, that's, no, 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 not so much. Come on, Nancy. Oh, this one is no time thing. for cheap publicity, Mr. Cannell. Listen, if that guy lays an egg, I want to get something out of it. I'm getting a Jane Doe ready. Oh, come on. Yes. Will you, fellas? Yeah, yeah. Give me a chance. Right, I have to make a sick one more. Well, that's fine, honey. You go ahead. Yes, All right, please, one you more. Hey, one go one ahead. How you doing? Oh. All right, Benny, bring him in. Uh, holy smoke, a happy helot. There you are, boss, just like you are. Symbols of little people. Okay, get him up. All right, young fellow. This is ridiculous, Mr. Canal. Come on, give me a chance. Give me some of the air. Hey, come on, stop it. Oh, fellas, I'm going to get out of here. No, come on, air. Come on, come on, that's right. Please do what you can get. All the things you want. Thank you very much. Come on. What do you have to do? That's right. Come on, Snooks, you better bail out. Say goodbye, Mr. Doe. Beanie. Oh, bye, oh, bye. Better get ready. One minute to go. Wow. Hey, one minute to go and the score is nothing to nothing. Now, please, John. 
You won't let me down, will you? Will you? Of course you won't. If you'll just think of yourself as the real John Doe. Listen, everything in that speech are things a certain man believed in. He was my father, John. When he talked, people listened. And they listened to you, too. Funny. You know what my mother said the other night? She said to look into your eyes. That I'd see father there. Hey, what do you say? Okay, we're coming. Come on. Now listen, John. You're a pitcher. Now get in there and pitch. Good luck. Give him a throw. Come on. Yeah. Let's get out of here. There's the door right there. Hey, what are you doing here? That's what I'd like to know. Come on, out, out. Hey, he's a friend of mine. Never mind, let him alone. He's all right. I'll be right over there pulling for you. the Chronicle. Tell them to start getting those extras out. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kenneth Fry speaking for the new bulletin. Tonight we give you something entirely new and different. Standing beside me is the young man who has declared publicly that on Christmas Eve he intends to commit suicide, giving as his reason, quote, I protest against the state of civilization, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, the new bulletin takes pleasure in presenting the man who is fast becoming the most talked up person in the whole country, John Doe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am the man you all know as John Doe. I took that name because it seems to describe, because it seems to describe the average man. And that's me. <coughs> and that's me. Well, it was me before I said I was going to jump off the city hall roof at midnight on Christmas Eve. Now I guess I'm not average anymore. Now I'm getting all sorts of attention. From big shots, too. You've been double-crossed. The mayor and the governor, for instance. They don't like those articles I've been writing. You're an imposter, young fellow. That's a pack of lies you're telling. Who wrote that speech for you? Ladies and gentlemen, the disturbance you just heard was caused by someone in the audience who tried to heckle Mr. Doe. The speech will continue. Well, people like the governor, people like the governor and that fellow there can, can stop worrying. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about us, the average guys, the John Doe's. If anybody should ask you what the average John Doe is like, you couldn't tell him because he's a million and one things. He's Mr. Big and Mr. Small. He's simple and he's wise. He's inherently honest, but he's got a streak of larceny in his heart. 
He seldom walks up to a public telephone without shoving his finger into the slot to see if somebody left a nickel there. <laughs> He's the man the ads are written for. He's the fellow everybody sells things to. He's Joe Dokes, the world's greatest stooge and the world's greatest strength. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir, we're a great family, the John Doe's. We are the meek who are, who are supposed to inherit the earth. You'll find us everywhere. We raise the crops, we dig the mines, work the factories, keep the books, fly the planes, and drive the buses. And when a cop yells, stand back there, you, he means us, the John Doe's. Well, what kind of a speech is that? Didn't you read it? We've existed since time began. We built the pyramids. We saw Christ crucified, pulled the oars for Roman emperors, sailed the boats for Columbus, retreated from Moscow with Napoleon, and froze with Washington at Valley Forge. Yes, sir, we've been in there dodging left hooks since before history began to walk. In our struggle for freak the canvas many a time, but we always bounce back because we're the people and we're tough. They've started a lot of talk about free people going soft, that we can't take it. That's a lot of hooey. A free people can beat the world at anything, from war to tiddlywinks, if we all pull in the same direction. I know a lot of you are, are saying, what can I do? I'm just a little punk. I don't count. Well, you're dead wrong. The little punks have always counted because in the long run, the character of a country is the sum total of the character of its little punks. <laughs> but we've all got to get in there and pitch. We can't win the old ball game unless we have teamwork. And that's where every John Doe comes in. It's up to him to get together with his teammate. And your teammate, my friend, is the guy next door to you. Your neighbor, he's a terribly important guy, that guy next door. You're going to need him, and he's going to need you, so look him up. If he's sick, call on him. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's out of a job, find him one. To most of you, your neighbor is a stranger, a guy with a barking dog and a high fence around him. Now, you can't be a stranger to any guy that's on your own team. So tear down the fence that separates you. Tear down the fence and you tear down a lot of hates and prejudices. Tear down all the fences in the country and you really have teamwork. I know a lot of you are saying to yourselves, he's asking for a miracle to happen. He's expecting people to change all of a sudden. Well, you're wrong. It's no miracle. It's no miracle because I see it happen once every year. And so do you. At Christmas time, there's something swell about the spirit of Christmas to see what it does to people, all kinds of people. Now, why can't that spirit, that same warm Christmas spirit, last the whole year round? Gosh, if it ever did, if each and every John Doe would make that spirit last 365 days out of the year, we'd develop such a strength we'd create such a tidal wave of goodwill that no human force could stand against it. Yes, sir, my friends, the meek can only inherit the earth when the John Doe's start loving their neighbors. You better start right now. Don't wait till the game is called on account of darkness. Wake up, John Doe, you're the hope of the world. John, you look wonderful. Let's get out of here. Now you're talking.
knew you'd wake up sooner or later. Boy, am I glad we got out of that mess. I had the 5,000 bucks sewed up. Could have been on my way to old Doc Brown. You're a pitcher, John, she says. Now, go in there and pitch. What a sucker. Yeah, she's a he-lot just like the rest of them. It's lucky you got away from her. What was I doing up there making a speech anyway? Me, huh? Jeez, the more I think about it, the yeah. more I could tear down all the fences. Why, if you tore one picket off of your neighbor's fence, he'd sue you. Five thousand bucks had it right in my hand. What do you mean he ran away? Go way after him. Find him. That man is terrific. Send it to him as a great cause for the common man. Ah, here he comes. Give him room down there. Give him room, folks. Come on, now. Come on, here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he Hello, John. Hello. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, we'd like to talk to him alone. Why, certainly, certainly. All right, everybody. Clear out. Everybody, quickly now. Come on. 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 Come <laughs> there's nobody holding you here, Mr. Doe. You can't, it's only natural that There's nobody you... holding us here. Let's get going. Incidentally, my name isn't Doe. It's Willoughby. Look, John, something terribly important happened. They're forming John Doe Clubs. We know of eight already, and they say that there's... John Doe Clubs? What for? Mm -hmm. To carry out the principles you talked about in your radio speech. I don't care what they're forming. I'm on my way, and I don't like the idea of being stopped either. Oh, but you don't know how big this thing is. You should see the thousands of telegrams we've received and what they're saying about you. Look, it started as a circulation stunt, didn't it? Well, you got your circulation. Now, why don't you let me alone? Oh, it started as a circulation stunt, but it isn't anymore. Mr. Norton wants to get back of it and sponsor John Doe Clubs all over the country. He wants to send you on a lecture tour. Me? Uh-huh. Oh, certainly. With your ability to influence people, it might grow into a glorious movement. Say, let's get something straight here. I don't want any part of this thing. If you've got an idea I'm going around lecturing to people, why, you're crazy. Baseball's my racket, and I'm sticking to it. Come on, Colonel, let's get out of here. John, please, please. I just got rid of one crowd. Oh, but please, Mr. Mayor, tell him the John Doe Club wants to talk to him. Let them in, Mr. Mayor. Let them come in. Okay, folks, but remember your manners. No stampeding. Walk slow, like you do when you come to pay your taxes. My name is Bert Hansen, Mr. Doe. I'm the head soda jerker at Schwabacher's Drugstore. Well, sir, you see, me and my wife, we heard your broadcast, and we got quite a bang out of it. Especially my wife. Kept me up half the night saying, that man's right, honey. The trouble with the world is nobody gives a hoot about his neighbor. That's why everybody in town sore and cranky at each other. And I kept saying, oh, that's fine, but how's a guy going to go around loving the kind of neighbors we got? Old Sourpuss, for instance. <laughs> you see, Sourpuss Smithers is a guy who lives all alone next door to us. He's a cranky old man that runs a second-hand furniture store. We haven't spoken to him for years. I always figured he was an ornery old gent that hated the world because he was always slamming his garage door and playing the radio so loud he kept half the neighbors up. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the Next morning, I'm out watering the lawn, and I look over, and there's Sourpuss on the other side of the head, straightening out a dent in his fender. And uh, my wife yells to me out the window. She says, go on, speak to him, Bert. And I figured, well, heck, I can't lose anything. So I yelled over to him, good morning, Mr. Smithers. He went right on pounding his fender. Was I burned? So I turned around to give my wife a dirty look, and she said, louder, louder, he didn't hear you. So in a voice you could have heard in the next county, I yell, good morning, Mr. Smithers. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Old Sourpuss turned around, surprise-like, and he put on a big smile, came over and took my hand like an old lodge brother, and he said, good morning, Hanson. I've been wanting to talk to you for years, only I thought you didn't like me. And then he started chatting away like a happy little kid, and he got so excited, his eyes off. Well... Mr. Doe, before we got through, I found out Smithers is a swell egg, only he's pretty deaf, and that accounts for all the noises. And he says it's a shame how little we know about our neighbors. And then he got an idea, and he said, how's about inviting everybody someplace where we can all get together and know each other a little better? Well, I'm feeling so good by this time, I'm ripe for anything, so Smithers goes around the neighborhood inviting everybody to a meeting at the schoolhouse, and I tell everybody that comes in the store, including Mr. Schwabecker, my boss, I'm talking too much. Well, I'll be doggone if for 40 people don't show up. Of course, none of us knew what to do, but we sure got a kick out of seeing how glad everybody was just to say hello to one another. Tell him about making Sourpuss chairman. Oh, yeah, we made Sourpuss chairman and decided to call ourselves the John Doe Club and say, incidentally, this is my wife. Come here, honey. This is my wife, Mr. Doe. How do you do, Mr. Doe? 
it's our puss is here, too. Oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> this is Sour Puss, or excuse me, uh, Mr. Smithers, Mr. Doe. That, that's all right. If you didn't call me Sour Puss, it wouldn't feel natural. <laughs> Well, anyway, I, I guess nearly everybody in the neighborhood came except the Delaney's. Uh, the Delaney's live in a big house with an iron fence around it, and they always keep their blinds drawn. And we always figured that he was just an old miser that sat back counting his money, so why bother about inviting him until uh, Grimes, the milkman, spoke up, and he said, uh, say, you've got the Delaney's all wrong. And then he tells us about how they canceled their milk last week and how when he found a note in the bottle, he got kind of curious-like, and he sort of peeked in under the blinds and found the house was empty. If you ask me, he says, they're starving. Old man Delaney has been bringing his furniture over to my place at night, one piece at a time, and selling it. Yeah, and, well, sir, a half dozen of us ran over there to fetch him, and we brought him to the meeting. And what a reception they got. Why, everybody shook hands with him and made a fuss over him, and, well, finally, Mr. and Mrs. Delaney just sat right down and cried. And then we started to find out about a lot of other people. Yeah, sure. Well, you know Grubel, for instance. Yeah, Grubel's right? here. Yeah, that, that's a... You don't know Grubel, but he's a man that everybody figured was the worst no account in the neighborhood because he, he was living like a hermit. And nobody would have anything to do with him. Uh, that isn't little Murphy. The postman told us the truth. Why, Grubel... He says he lives out of garbage cans because he won't take charity, because it'll ruin his self-respect, he says. Just like you said on the radio, Mr. Doe. Well, sir, about a dozen families got together and gave Grubel a job watering their lawns. Isn't that wonderful? And then we found jobs for six other people, and they've all gone off for relief. Yeah, and my boss, Mr. Schwabacher, made a job in his warehouse for old man Delaney. And he gave you that $5 raise. Yeah, wasn't that swell? My <laughs> <laughs> Bert, I... I feel slighted. I'd like to join, but nobody asked me. Uh, I'm sorry, Mayor, but we voted that no politician could join. Just the John Doe's of the neighborhood could. You know how politicians are. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the reason we wanted to tell you this, Mr. Doe, was to, to, to give you an idea of what you started. And from where I'm sitting, I... I don't see any sense in you jumping off any building. No, <laughs> oh, no. Well, thank you for listening. Goodbye, Mr. Doe. You're a wonderful man. And it strikes me you can be mighty useful walking around for a while. Uh, say goodbye, Bye. Mr. Doe. Bye. 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 I'm Mrs. Delaney, Mr. Doe. And God bless you, my boy. I'm all mixed up. I don't get it. Look, all those swell people think I'm going to jump off a building or something. I never had any such idea. Gosh. This fellow would have to be a mighty fine example himself to go around telling other people how to... Say, look, what happened the other night was on account of Miss Mitchell here. She wrote the stuff. Don't you see what a wonderful thing this can be? But we need you, John. You're hooked. I can see that right now. They got you. Well, I'm through. For three years, I've been trying to get you up to the Columbia River country. First, it was your glass arm. Then it was the radio. And now it's the John Doe clubs. Well, I ain't waiting another minute. <laughs> Gangway, you heelock. Oh. Hey, Colonel, wait a minute. Oh, John Doe and Miss Mitchell and handle the press and the radio. Me? Yes, I don't want to take any chances. And John? Yes, TV. Your crew will do the mop-up job. They'll follow John Doe into every town, see that the clubs are properly organized and the chart is issued. Right. There are only eight flags up there now. I want to see that map covered before we get through.
there. If they made demands, I understand it. But the John Doe's ask for nothing. People are going off relief. If this keeps up, I'll be out of a job. As soon as they get strong enough, we'll find out what John Doe wants. 30 every Thursday. 60 at 60. Who knows what? I'm sorry, boss. They just won't let anybody talk politics to them. It's crazy. We've got to get to them. They represent millions of voters. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing has been nothing short of a prairie fire. We've received so many applications for charters to the John Doe clubs, we haven't been able to take care of them. I hate to have that many pins stuck in me. <laughs> this John Doe convention is a natural. It's going to put our city on the map. By over 2,400 John Doe clubs are sending delegates. Can you imagine that? You, Mr. Mayor, will be the official host. You will make the arrangements for decorating the city parades and a reception for John Doe when he gets home. And don't wear your high hat. No high hat? No high hat. And from you, Canel. I want a special John Doe edition every day until the convention is over. And now, if you will, please, uh, step into the outer office and look your prettiest because there are photographers there to take pictures of this committee. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, Libby. Everything will be taken care of. Sure. Isn't it all too wonderful? Oh, Mr. Mayor, would you step down in front of me? You ladies get close Well, I don't get it. Get what? Look, B.B., I'm supposed to know my way around. This John Doe movement has cost you a fortune. Now, this convention is going to cost plenty. Well? Well, I'm stuck with two and two, and I'm a sucker if I can make four out of it. Where do you come in? Well, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that my money has been spent for a worthy cause. I see. I better stick to running the paper, huh? I think maybe you better have. Well, Canal, I'd like to have the John Doe contract. All the receipts for the money we advanced him with the letter Miss Mitchell wrote which I gave her a thousand dollars. Yes, sure. Well, we leave for the airport half an hour. Is that Johnny Boy's room? Better hustle him up. He's already there, Tom. He's packing. Oh, ah, good. Did you see his picture on the cover of time? Yeah. I gotta give you credit, Annie Girl. I've handled a good many big promotions in my time. Everything from a World Fair to a Channel swimmer. But this one has certainly got me spinning. And now a John Doe convention. Wow. Hey. If you could only get him to jump off the city hall roof on Christmas Eve, I'd guarantee you half a million people there. Charlie, hmm? what do you make of him? Oh, a Johnny boy? Well, I don't know what angle you want, but I'll give it to you quick. Number one, he's got great yokel appeal, but he's a nice guy. Number two, he's beginning to believe he really wrote that original suicide letter that you made up. Number three, he thinks that you're Jean of Arc or something. Yeah, I know. Number four, well, you know what number four is. He's nuts about you. Yeah, it's running out of his ears. You left out number five. We're all healed, me especially. Oh, smoke. Come in. Smoke pack. Good, I'll go and get Beanie Boy. Okay, Charlie Boy. Your pack? No, thank you. Do you care if I sit down out here? No. You know, I had a crazy dream last night. About you. About me? <laughs> sure was crazy. I dreamt I was your father. <laughs> there, was, there was something I was trying to stop you from doing. So, uh, so I got up out of bed and I walked right through the wall here, right straight into your room. <laughs> you know how dreams are. And, and, and there you were in bed. But you're, you're a little girl, you know, about 10. And very pretty, too. So I, I shook you. And the moment you opened your eyes, you hopped out of bed and started running like the devil in your nightgown. You ran right out the window there, and you ran out over the tops of buildings and roofs and everything for miles. And I was chasing you. 
And, and all the time you were running, you kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon you were as big as you are now, you know, grown up. And all the time I kept, I kept asking myself, what am I chasing her for? And I didn't know. <laughs> Isn't that a hot one? Well, anyway, you ran into some place, and then I ran in after you, and, and when I got there, there you were, getting married. And the nightgown had changed into a beautiful wedding gown. <laughs> you sure look pretty, too. <laughs> and then I knew what it was I was trying to stop you from doing. Dreams are sure crazy, aren't they? Well, would you like to know who it was you were marrying? Oh, well, our tall, handsome Eubangy, I suppose. <laughs> no, not that bad. It was that fellow that sends you flowers every day. Yeah, what's his name? Mr. Norton? Nephew? Ed Sheldon. Yeah, that's the one. But here's the funniest part of it all. I was the fellow up there doing the marrying, you know, the justice of peace or something. You were? I thought you were chasing me. Well, yes, I was, but I was your father then, see? But the real me, John Doe, or that is, <laughs> Long John Willoughby, I was the fella up there with a book. You know what I mean? I guess so. Then what happened? Well, I took you across my knee and I started spanking you. That is, I didn't do it. I mean, I did do it, but it, it wasn't me, you see. I was your father then. <laughs> well, I had you across my knee and I said, Annie? I won't allow you to marry a man that's, that's just rich or that has his secretary send you flowers. The man you marry has got to swim rivers for you. He's got to climb high mountains for you. He's got to slay dragons for you. He's got to perform wonderful deeds for you. Yes, sir. And all the time, uh, the guy up there, you know, with the book, me, just stood there nodding his head. He said, go to it, Pop. Buy her one for me because that's just the way I feel about it, too. So he said, come on down here and whack her yourself. So I came down and I whacked you a good one. See? <laughs> and he whacked you. And I whacked you another one. We both started whacking you like. Well, if you're through whacking her, come on, let's get going. Okay, fellas, right in here. You go out the side end, there's a bunch of autograph seekers out front. We'll be down with the bags in a minute. Come on, don't make a government project out of this. Hi, Benny. When's our plane take off again? A couple of minutes. Uh, how many people do you think we've talked to already? Uh, outside the radio, I mean. Oh, I don't know. About 300,000. 300,000. What makes them do it, Ann? What makes them come and listen and, and get up their John Doe clubs the way they do? I've been trying to figure it out. Look, John. What we're handing them are platitudes, things they've heard a million times. Love thy neighbor, clouds have silver linings, turn the other cheek, it's just Yeah, I heard them a million times, too, but... There you are. Maybe they're like me, just beginning to get an idea of what those things mean. I, mean, I never thought much about people before. They were always just somebody to fill up the bleachers. And the only time I worried about them is, if they, is when they didn't come in to see me pitch. Lately, I've been watching them when I talk to them. I could see something in their faces. I could feel that they were hungry for something. You know what I mean? Maybe that's why they came. Maybe they're just lonely and wanted somebody to say hello to. I know how they feel. I've been lonely and hungry for something practically all my life. Somebody else sitting here? No, no, no. That's your seat. And this is your coat. Mine? <laughs> A little token of appreciation. Oh. Oh, it's beautiful, D.B. <laughs> I don't quite know what to say. Well, don't say anything at all. Just sit down. Oh. Go ahead. Open it. Open it. Lovely. 
Certainly. And a new contract goes with it. Well, come on, spring it. You've got something on your mind. It must be stupendous. <laughs> you know, that's what I like about it. Right to the point, like that. <laughs> All right, back to Glenny. Here it is. Tomorrow night, before a crowd of 15,000 people and talking over a nationwide radio hookup, John Doe will <sighs> announce the formation of a third party. A third party? <sighs> yes, the John Doe party. Devoted entirely to the interests of all the John Doe's all over the country. Which practically means 90% of the voters. He will also announce the third party's candidate for the presidency. A man whom he personally recommends. A great humanitarian. The best friend the John Doe's have. Mr. D.B. Norton. Yes. The delegates are already pouring into the ballpark by the drove, with lunch baskets, banners, and petitions asking John Doe not to jump off any roof. But no matter how you look at it, it's still a phenomenal movie. These John Doe's, or the hoi polloi, as you've heard people call them, have been laughed at and ridiculed, but here they are, gay and happy, having traveled thousands of miles, their expenses paid by their neighbors, to come here to pay homage to their hero, John Doe. And in these days of wars and bombings, it's a hopeful sign that a simple idea like this can sweep the country. An idea based on friendliness, on giving and not taking, on helping your neighbor and asking nothing in return. And if a thing like this can happen, don't let any of your grumbling friends tell you that humanity is falling apart. This is John B. Hughes signing off now and returning you to our main studio until 9 o'clock, when the convention will officially open. John, come in. Say, I'm kind of... It's raining out a little. That's all right. It's good to see you. Sit down. Right. <laughs> it's for Ann. Oh, how nice. Thank you very much. Flowers. I'm terribly sorry she isn't here. She isn't? No, she just left. I'm surprised you didn't run into her. She went over to Mr. Norton's house. Oh. Did you want to see her about something important? Yeah. Uh, well, no, it'll wait. <laughs> but he's a nice man, isn't he? Mr. Norton, I mean. He's, uh, he's done an awful lot for the... Hey, my coat's pretty wet, man. I'm afraid I might have wet the couch a little. Well, I guess I'll see her at the convention later. Yes, of course. I'll see that she gets the flowers. Thanks. Good night, Mrs. Mitchell. Good night, John. Say, Mrs. Mitchell, I, uh... I'm kind of glad Ann isn't here. See, I'm, <laughs> I came over here hoping to see her alone. I'm kind of hoping I wouldn't, too, you know what I mean? There was something I wanted to talk to her about. But, well, I can wait, I guess. Good night. Good night, John. Say, look, Mrs. Mitchell, have you ever been married? I'm sure you haven't, do I? That's pretty silly. But I guess you must think I'm kind of batty. <laughs> well, I guess I'd better be going to bed. John. My husband said, I love you. Will you marry me? He did? Mm -hmm. What happened? 
I married him. Yeah, that's what I mean, see? It was easy as all that, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, but look, Mrs. Mitchell. You know, I, I love Anne, and it's gonna be awfully hard for me to say it. Because, well, you know, she's so wonderful. And, well, the best I ever was was a Bush League pitcher. And, you know, I think she's in love with another man. The one she made up. You know, the real John Doe. Well, that's, <laughs> that's pretty tough competition. I bet you he'd know how to say it all right. For me, I, I get up to it and around it and in back of it, but, but I never get right to it. You know what I mean? So the only chance I've got is, well, if somebody could kind of give her a warning, sort of, sort of prepare her for the shock. You mean you'd like me to do it, huh? Well, I was thinking, yeah, you know, sort of break the ice. Of course I will, John. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Hey, you're okay. <laughs> this John Doe me is going to be one of the biggest things that ever happened. Why they're coming from all over trains, boxcars, <laughs> wagons, all the. <laughs> Hello, bodyguards. Hey, had your dinner yet? Okay. Well, that's all right. Look, no, go ahead and have your dinner. Wait right? a minute, John. Hello, Mr. Connell. All right, John. John, I want to have a little talk with you. What's, what's the matter? Are you falling? Come on. Hey, boy. Oh, quiet, quiet, quiet. Say, tell me something. Did, did you read the speech you're going to make tonight? No, I never read the speeches before I make them. I get more of a kick out of it that way. Uh-huh, that's just exactly what I thought. Beanie, go on down to the office, tell Papa to give you a speech. There's a copy on my desk. Gee whiz, boss, you know Mr. Norton told me not to leave it, not even for a minute. Go on, go on, go on, go on. We'll be at Jim's bar up the street. You're a nice guy, John. I like you. You're gentle. I always like gentle people. Me, I'm, I'm hard. Hard and tough. I got a use for hard people. Gotta be gentle to suit me. Like you, for instance. Yep, I'm hard. But you wanna know something? I got a weakness. I guess that would you. Star-Spangled Banner. I'm a sucker for it. Always gets me right here. You know what I mean? Yeah, it gets me right back here. Oh, back there, huh? Well, every man to his own taste. You, you weren't old enough. You weren't old enough for the World War, were you, Jim? No, no, of course not. Well, you, you must have been just kidding. I was. I was just ripe and raring to go. You know what my old man did when I joined up? He joined up, too. Got to be a sergeant. And that's a kick for it. We were in the same outfit. Funny, huh? Hmm? He was. I was right there, and I saw it with my own eyes. Me, I came out without a scratch. That is, excepting my ulcers. We should be drinking milk, you know, this stuff is poison. Hey, tell me. Yes, Mr. Connell. What do you say, huh? All right. Yep, I'm a sucker for this country. I'm a sucker for the size bingo matter, and I'm a sucker for this country. I like what we got here. I like it. A guy can say what he wants and do what he wants, but 
without having a bandage shoved through his belly. And that's all right. Butcher. Yeah. Well, we don't want anybody coming around chasing the devil. No, sir. When I do, I get mad. I get boiling mad. And right now, John, I'm sizzling. I get mad for a lot of other guys besides myself. I get mad for a guy named Washington and a guy named Jefferson and Lincoln. Lighthouses, John. Lighthouses in a foggy world. You know what I mean? Yeah, you bet. Mm. Listen, pal. This fifth, this fifth column stuff is pretty rotten, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. And you'd feel like an awful sucker if you found yourself marching right in the middle of it, wouldn't you? You. Of course, you wouldn't know it because you're a gentleman. But that's what she's doing. You're mixed up with a skunk, my boy. A no good, dangerous skunk. So you're not talking about Mr. Norton, are you? I'm not talking about his grandfather's pet poodle. Must be wrong, Mr. Cannell. He's been marvelous about the John Doe clubs. Yeah. <laughs> Say, you're a sold on this John Doe idea, aren't you? Sure. Uh, sure. I don't blame you. Sure am I. It's a beautiful America. America ought to only happen right here in the good old USA. And I think it's terrific. What do you think of that? Me, hard boiled Cannell, and I think it's plenty terrific. All right. Now, supposing a certain unmentionable worm whose initials are D.B. was trying to use that to shove his way into the White House so he could put the screws in it, so he could turn out the lights in those lighthouses. What would you say about that, huh? Nobody's going to do that, Mr. Cannell. They can't use the John Doe clubs for politics. That's the main idea. Is that so? Then what's a big political boss like Hammer doing in town? And a labor leader like Bennett? A lot of other big shots are up at DB's house right now. Wolves, John. Wolves. Waiting to cut up the John Doe's. <coughs> Wait till you get a gander at the speech you're gonna make tonight. You're all wet. Miss Mitchell writes those speeches. Nobody can make her write that kind of stuff. They can't, huh? Who do you think writes them? My Aunt Emma? I know she writes them. And gets a big bonus for doing them, too. A mink coat and a diamond bracelet. Don't write them. Why, that gold-grabbing dame would double-cross her own mother for a handful of Chinese yam. Shut up. If you weren't drunk, I'd... Hey, boss. Here's the speech, boss. Hey. Go on and read it, John, and then start sucking. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Doe. Tommy. Yes? Better bring me a glass of milk. I, I'm smoking too much. Yes, Charlie? Got everything all set? Fine. John Doe been taken care of? Good. How many people do you think will be there? 15,000. Oh, my, that's fine. Now, listen, Charlie. As soon as John Doe stops talking about me, I want you to start that demonstration. And make it a big one, you understand? Don't worry about that, D.B. My boys are there. They'll take care of it. What? Yes, I'll be there 15 minutes after I get your call. Why, Mr. Doe? Where are they? In the dining room. Now, gentlemen, I think we're about ready to throw that great big bombshell. Yeah, well, it's about time. Even a conservative estimate shows that we can count on anywhere between 10 and 20 million John Doe votes. Uh, add to that the labor vote that Mr. Bennett will throw in, and the votes controlled by Mr. Hammett and the rest of you gentlemen in your own territories, and nothing can stop us. As I said before, I'm with you, providing you can guarantee the John Doe vote. Don't worry about that. You can count on me on one condition. Little Bennett's got to be taken care of. Didn't I tell you that everybody in this room would be taken care of? My agreement with you gentlemen stands. I'm with you, D.B., but I still think it's a very daring thing we're attempting. These are daring times, Mr. Barrington. 
We're coming to a new order of things. There's too much talk been going on in this country. That's too many concessions true. have been made. True. What the American people need is an iron hand. That's right. right. That's, That's true. true. That's right. Quite right, A.B. Discipline. Quite right. And now, may I offer a little toast to Miss Ann Mitchell, a brilliant and beautiful lady who is responsible for all this. Miss Mitchell. Miss Mitchell. Miss Mitchell. Mr. Norton, I'd like to talk to you alone for a minute. Oh, oh. <laughs> Miss Mitchell has something to say to us. Oh, 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 oh. Hello. John, I'm so glad to see you. I was terribly worried. Did you write this? Yes, I did, John, but I, I had no idea what was going on. You didn't? No. That's a swell bracelet you're wearing. John, why aren't you at the convention? Is there anything wrong? No, no, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. So there's going to be a new order of things, huh? Everybody's going to cut himself a nice fat slice of the John Doe's, eh? You forgot one detail, Mr. Big Shot. You forgot me, the prize stooge of the world. Why, if you or anybody else thinks he's going to use the John Doe clubs for his own rotten purpose, he's going to have to do it over my dead body. Well, hold on a minute, young man. Hold on, that's rather big talk. I started the John Doe clubs with my money. And I'll decide whether or not they're being properly used. No, you won't. You're through deciding anything. And what's more, I'm going down to that convention and I'm going to tell those people exactly what you and all your fine feathered friends here are trying to cook up for them. And I'm going to say it in my own words this time. Yes, Stop it, Willie. He might do it. He ruined the TV. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, fella. My uncle wants to talk to you. Hey, listen to me, my son. Before you lose your head completely, may I remind you that I picked you up out of the gutter and I can throw you right back there again? You've got a nerve accusing people of things. These gentlemen and I know what's best for the John Doe's of America, regardless of what tramps like you think. Get off that righteous horse of yours and come to your senses. You're the fake. We believe in what we're doing. You're the one that was paid the 30 pieces of silver. Have you forgotten that? Well, I haven't. You're a fake John Doe, and I can prove it. You're the big hero that's supposed to jump off tall buildings and things. Do you remember? What do you suppose your precious John Doe's will say when they find out that you never had any intention of doing it, that you were being paid to say so? You're lucky they didn't run you out of the country. And with the newspapers and the radio stations that these gentlemen control, we can kill the John Doe movement deader than a doornail. We'll do it, too, the moment you step out of line. Now, if you still want to go to that convention and shoot your trap off, you go ahead and do it. You mean to tell me you'll try to kill the John Doe movement if you can't use it to get what you want? You bet your bottom dollar we would. Well, that certainly is a new look. I guess I've seen everything now. You sit there back of your big cigars and think of deliberately killing an idea that's made millions of people a little bit happier. An idea that's brought thousands of them here from all over the country, by bus and by freight and jalopies and on foot, so they can pass on to each other their own simple little experiences. Why, look, I'm just a mug and I know it, but I'm beginning to understand a lot of things. Why, your type's as old as history. If you can't lay your dirty fingers on a decent idea and twist it and squeeze it and stuff it into your own pocket, you slap it down. Like dogs, if you can't eat something, you bury it. Why, this is the one worthwhile thing that's come along. People are finally finding out that the guy next door isn't a bad egg. That's simple, isn't it? And yet a thing like this got a chance of spreading till it touches every last doggone human being in the world, and you talk about, about killing it. Why, when this fire dies down, what's going to be left? More misery, more hunger, and more hate. And what's to prevent that from starting all over again? Nobody knows the answer to that one, and certainly not you with those slimy bollocks up theories you got. 
The John Doe idea may be the answer, though. It may be the one thing capable of saving this cockeyed world. Yet you sit back there on your fat hulks and tell me you'll kill it if you can't use it. Well, you go ahead and try. You couldn't do it in a million years with all your radio stations and all your power. Because it's bigger than whether I'm a fake. It's bigger than your ambitions. And it's bigger than all the bracelets and fur coats in the world. You bet it is, John. And that's exactly what I'm going down there to tell those people. <laughs> Minute. You aren't grateful, right? My uncle's been too good. <laughs> Hundreds of yelling newsboys are swarming into the park like locusts. They're yelling John Doe's a fake, fake.
are suckers and I'm the biggest of the lot. I spent a fortune backing this man in what I believe to be a sincere and worthy cause, just as you all did. And now I find out it's nothing but a cheap racket cooked up by him and two of my employees for the sole purpose of collecting dues from John Doe's all over the country. That's a lie. That's a lie. Nickels and dimes to stuff into their own pockets. You can read all about it in the newspapers there. That's a lie. Let's have him go. This man has no intention of jumping off the top of a building. He was paid to say so. Do you deny that? That's got nothing to do with it. This is what you paid for it, aren't you? Yes, I was paid, but there happened. And what about the suicide note? You didn't write that either. What difference did you write it or didn't you? No, I didn't write it. Now, you bet your life you didn't. You look in your papers, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll find this Mr. Frank's confession that he was the one who wrote it. Listen, folks, it's a fact that I didn't write the letter. Now, you see, he admits that you're a fake John Doe. And for what you have done to all these good people, they ought to run you out of the country. And I hope they do it. and riot. Break this crowd up. Come on. I'm sorry, folks, but we can't hear him anymore. Something's gone wrong with the loudspeaker. John Doe's a fake! Boo! Great. They can't hear me. Boo! This thing's not working. Ladies and gentlemen. that man much of a chance. Have some more coffee long, John? No, thanks, Tom. Ha, ha, ha. 
wonderful man. And God bless you, my boy. Now get in there and pay attention. You're a fake job, though, and I can prove it. You're the big hero who's supposed to jump off tall buildings and things. Do you remember? What do you suppose your precious John Doe's will say when they find out that you never had any intention of doing it, that you were being paid to say so? Christmas Eve at midnight. <laughs> John Doe. Is that screwball still around? Ah, uh, Dame's been calling all day. Sure, sure, I know. Yeah, at midnight, huh? <laughs> okay, lady. We'll have the place surrounded with nets. <laughs> They're laughing at me. You're a sick girl, Ann. You better take it easy. Whom are you calling now? You called that number, not ten minutes ago. Hello, Mr. Cannell. Have you seen him yet? Have you... Now listen, Ann, he can't possibly get in without our seeing him. I'm watching the side door and the Colonel's out front, so stop worrying. Oh. Thank you. What, well, Ann? Ann, don't be foolish. This isn't the craziest, the battiest, the looniest wild goose chase I ever heard oh, of. Oh, shut up, Bert. Sourpuss is right. Yeah, well, if he is, I'm a banana split. That man is going to be on that roof. Don't ask me how I know. I just know, and you know it as well as I do. Sure, sure. I'd like to believe in fairy tales, but a guy that's a fake isn't going to jump off any roof. I don't think he was any fake, not with that face. And anyway, what he stood for wasn't a fake. Okay, honey, okay. As the elevator goes. We got to walk up to the tower.
That tramp is probably full of Christmas cheer and asleep in some slop house. Let's go. I've got to decorate my tree. Well, I give up. I don't know what gave us the idea that we need to attempt anything like this. I guess you're right. I'm afraid the joke's on us. Let's go. I hope nobody finds out you've been here. I wouldn't do that if I were you, John. It'll do you no good. The mayor has policemen downstairs with instructions to remove all marks of identification you may have on your person. You'll be buried in Potter's Field and you will have accomplished nothing. care of that. I've already mailed a copy of this letter to Mr. Canal. John, why don't you forget this foolishness? Stop right where you are, Mr. Norton, if you don't want to go overboard with me. I'm glad you gentlemen are here. You killed the John Doe movement, all right. But you're going to see us born all over again. Now, take a good look, Mr. Norton. John! John! Oh, John, no, no, I won't let you out of here, darling. Oh, please. Please don't give up. We'll start all over again. Just you and I. It isn't too late. The John Doe movement isn't dead yet. You see, John, it isn't dead or they wouldn't be here. It's alive in me. They catch it alive by being afraid of that's why they came up here. Oh, darling. <laughs> sure, it should have been killed. It was dishonest. Well, we can start clean now. Just you and I. It'll grow, John, and it'll grow big because it'll be honest this time. Oh, John, if it's worth dying for, it's worth living for. Oh, please, John. Oh, <laughs> oh please, please, God help. John, John, look at me. You want to be honest, don't you? Well, you don't have to die to keep the John Doe idea alive. Someone already died for that one. The first John Doe. And he's kept that idea alive for nearly 2,000 years. It was he who kept it alive in them. And he'll go on keeping it alive forever and always. 
For every gun don't move with these men kill a new one will be born. That's why those bells are ringing, John. They're calling to us. Not to give up, but to keep on fighting, to keep on pitching. Oh, don't you see, darling? This is no time to give up. You and I, John, we... Oh, no. No, John. If you die, I want to die, too. Oh, oh I love you. <laughs> Mr. Doe, you don't have to... We're with you, Mr. Doe. We just lost our heads and acted like a mob. What we Brett's trying to say is that we need you, Mr. Doe. There were a lot of us that didn't believe what that man said. We were going to start up our John Doe Club again, whether we saw you or not, were we, Bert? And there were a lot of others that were going to do the same thing. Well, Mr. Sarpus even got a letter from his cousin in Toledo. And I got it right here, Mr. Doe. Only, only it'd be a lot easier with you. Please. Please come with us, Mr. Doe. John. Mr. Doe. Here, Will, help me with it. She'll be all right. Mr. Doe, take her right down to the car. Right up. Oh, we got a car right, right down. Leon Norton, the people. Try and lick that.